Hello, my name is Blaine Bettinger, and I want to talk to you about the matching tree method, otherwise known as building quick and dirty trees. So quick and dirty trees is a way of identifying your genetic matches and how they might be connected to you. What exactly is a quick and dirty tree? A quick and dirty tree is an unverified tree that's built very quickly only for potentially finding known or suspected names or locations that you share in common with uh, one of your genetic matches. So essentially, pursuant to this process, what you do is you will build a tree for a match in hopes of finding a common ancestor or location that will give you clues about how the two of you are related. It's really important to know, however, that a quick and dirty tree will only generate hints. A quick and dirty tree is not proof of anything. A quick and dirty tree has to be documented and verified if you're going to use it to reach a genealogical conclusion. Because as we know, quick and dirty trees, uh, as we'll see, rely on information that's been gathered, correlated by other individuals. And so because that's a lot of levels of abstraction, there are plenty of chances for there to be errors. So we want to make sure that we are not perpetuating those errors when we build these quick and dirty trees and then use that information for a genealogical conclusion. Instead, we are only going to use quick and dirty trees for hints. And one important thing to remember as well is that a quick and dirty tree is not a mirror tree. The difference is a mirror tree, although it is a tree that's built for your genetic match, what happens with a mirror tree is that tree is then attached to your DNA test results or the DNA test results of that uh, some test taker. Now the reason that is is that that is an attempt to generate those shared ancestor hints at Ancestry. So by building that mirror tree and attaching it to the results, what you're hoping to do is to generate those shared ancestor hints. That is not a quick and dirty tree method. The quick and dirty tree is never attached to anyone's DNA. You're simply building the quick and dirty tree in hopes of finding surnames and locations that you recognize rather than trying to build, uh, generate random shared ancestor hints. Now, if you're interested in using this method and building these quick and dirty trees, you must watch this 23 minute video from Ancestry. So this was created and is narrated by Krista Cowan and Angie Bush, and it talks all about quick and dirty method, the mirror trees, and so on. So this is really a, a must-watch for anyone that's interested in this topic. An excellent, excellent video. All right, so let's use the quick and dirty method to figure out or get clues about how Framasong 5 is related to us. So Framasong 5 is a new match. We can click on that match and then start to work through our process. So the first step in our process is to see how much DNA we share in common. So we'll click the little eye there and down comes this pop-up that says we share 53 centimorgans in common. That'll put us right around fifth cousins or so. I'm sorry, fourth cousins or so. Could be more distant, could be closer, but that's around the range where we're going to be looking, somewhere around fourth cousins. So after that, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look and see the, what the tree of this individual looks like. Because that's what we do with most of our matches, look at the tree to try to find a connection. Now, this match, Framasung 5, does not have a full tree. However, he does have an unlinked tree. So an unlinked tree means he's built a tree, but he has not yet matched that to his, uh, attached that to his DNA results. So what we can see here is that when we look at his unlinked trees, he has an unlinked tree called the right family tree. So we're going to click on the right family tree, and when we do, we see there's only one person in that tree. So this can be problematic because what we really wanted to hopefully find was a full tree that we could easily review and see if there are any locations or surnames or ancestors in common. Well, obviously we can't do that here. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to build a tree for this match. And you will find yourself building trees for many, many, many of your matches. In fact, I typically will try to build a tree for a match even before I contact them because it's usually more efficient. So what we're going to do is we're going to click on uh, full view full tree here just in case there might be other information in the tree that we don't see here. Now, in this case, there wasn't, 
but sometimes there is, so it's always worth doing. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna click on Mary Ellis Rowell so that we can review the information associated with her. When we do that, what we see is we have birth and death dates for Mary Ellis. Now, it's not, it's not in a conventional format, but we can see that, for example, she was born uh, September 26th, 1923 in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and then is reported to have died in September 11th in 1993, also in Bridgeport. So this is, in fact, pretty good information about Mary Alice Rowell. What's interesting is that this is it. This is all the information we have so far about our connection to this particular match. So as long as we can identify Mary, then we should be able to build a, a very, uh, or uh, hopefully a relatively complete tree for this genetic match that may lead us to clues about how we're connected. So the first thing, of course, that we have to do is we have to identify Mary Alice Rowell and find her biological family so that we can then start to build out the tree. And we could use any source at all to do this. Uh, Google, newspapers, find a grave, family search, ancestry, those are all excellent methods to identify who Mary Alice Rowell was. Um, particularly in this time frame, 1993, we might very well find an obituary for Mary Alice Rowell or uh, an obituary of a, another relative, for example, that mentions her all kinds of different sources we can use here. One source we're going to use is we're going to use the public member trees at Ancestry. So if we go into the search bar, the drop down has public member trees, and once we get that, what we're going to do is we are going to enter in the information we, we know. So for example, we're going to enter in Mary Alice for the first and middle names, Raoul for the last name, and then the birth information. Now, don't be afraid to play around with this information. All right, so some of the tricks for these public member trees is to try to use more information and then try to use less information. Um, you might have to broaden the birth and death dates because people do make mistakes. And sometimes you can use just initials for the names. Those are just a few of the clues. But if you don't get good hits, keep playing around with it. Try to find a, a connection that, that the, or information that will lead you to a, a good hit. Now you can see here, for example, um, I did get a good hit here for Mary Alice Rowell. And remember, the tree that she was found in was called the Wright tree. And here you can see her spouse is listed as Charles S. Wright. So not only that, but there's a birth date of 1903 in Connecticut. There is one discrepancy, and that says the death was in 1990 in Bridgeport. Remember, we said earlier it was 1993. And in fact, when I tried to search the public member trees with a death date of 1993, I couldn't get a hit. It wasn't until I removed that death date that I finally got a hit for Mary Ellis Rowell. So don't be afraid to play around with that information. But I feel very strongly that this is likely the Mary Alice Rowell we're interested in. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use that information to build a tree. I click on Mary Alice Rowell and up comes her profile. And I can see there's all kinds of great information here. There's uh, the birth and death date and location. There's names for her parents. There's a spouse's name. There is documentation which will come in very handy down the road when we want to add documentation to this quick and dirty tree so there's all kinds of, of very good information here with that information then I can start to build a tree now it's also important to note that I didn't have to find this through ancestry I could have gotten this information anywhere for example here I found at family search I did a just a general search of Mary Alice Rowell in Bridgeport Connecticut and the very first hit is the 1910 census, which is in fact the same Mary Alice Rowell. So it doesn't matter where you get this information, you can do it in one place, you can do it multiple places, but just need to make a, a connection and place that person within a, a potential tree. So once I have this, now I can build a tree for Mary Alice Rowell. Now some people will build this as sort of a floating branch and an existing tree, and others will build this as a, a brand new tree. The first thing we do is we're gonna add this new person, and what we're going to do is we're going to copy that information from the identified tree. So we're going to add Mary Ellis Rowell with the birth date, the death date, and then we'll save that individual. And then we just continue to build the tree. We'll add the father, also copying that information from the identified tree, Daniel W. Rowell. Now once we add the second person, it will ask us to save the tree, as long as we're not putting this in an existing tree. Here I'm going to name it Quick and Dirty Tree for Framasong 5. All right, now... I'm also going to unclick the button there that says allow others to view this tree. I don't want other people to see this tree until I've verified it 
or I've contacted the match, or uh, maybe I will never let anyone see this. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to unclick this because I do not want other people to see it. All right, then I'll save it. And I will also make the tree private and unsearchable, meaning the other, uh, other individuals at Ancestry cannot find this tree even if they, they search for it. So what I'm going to do first is hit the, the black bar there for the tree, and down will come this drop-down menu. And one of those selections is Tree Settings. Okay. Under Tree Settings, I hit Privacy Settings on the next page. That will take me to the Privacy Settings page. And here is where I click Private Tree, which again means other people can't see it, and I make it unsearchable. So I prevent my tree from being found in searches by other individuals. What does this mean? That means that I don't spread the misinformation that is almost guaranteed to exist in my quick and dirty tree. Instead, I've made it so it is contained. That also means that my match will not inadvertently find it, which does, I don't want to be the initial contact between us. I want to be able to reach out to this match before they find that I built a tree for them. Okay, now that it's private and unsearchable, we can build the tree. Here you can see I already have hints about the tree here, particularly I have a hint for a potential mother for Mary Alice Rowell. So I'm going to click on potential mother, which is just generated by Ancestry's algorithms. I'm going to click on that, and then up comes this information. I'll click on review details, and now I have a uh, information about a potential match for Mary Alice Rowell being her mother or potential mother, Alice Jennet Jennings. Now, I'm going to just add this. Right? I'm not going to be verifying this information. The one thing I will do, however, is I'll make sure that the, the date of the birth of the mother makes sense, meaning she was neither too young nor too old to have been Mary Alice Rowell's mother. Other than that, I'm not going to open it up. I'm not going to look at documents. I'm just going to add this because, again, I'm building a quick and dirty tree. Down the road, of course, I want to verify this. For now, I'm just building a quick and dirty tree. So I hit yes. And now she's been added to the tree. I'm getting new potential hints. And so all I'm going to do is I'm just going to build the tree using this process. If I hit a dead end, what I'll do is then I can go to some documents, do some traditional research. The one thing I don't want to do is I don't want to spend days and days on this, however. I want to try to do this as quickly as possible to build out the tree as far as I can. Here I've built out this tree for a number of generations, remembering that Mary Alice Rowell is the grandmother. So here we're building it out for quite a few generations for the test taker. But what I note now is nothing's really jumping out at me at this stage. Might be a little bit early to jump ship here, but I see that nothing is jumping out at me. No names or locations that seem to be recognizable. But what's important to remember is that Mary Alice Rowell was only a one grandparent of the test taker. So what we're going to do is we're going to chase down the husband of Mary Alice Rowell, which is doesn't even have a spot on this tree, but it will be the, the parent of that uh, top most private individual, for example. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to Mary Alice Rowell's profile. I don't remember what, the, what Mary Alice's husband's name was, so we're going to go to her profile. And once we do that, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the hints here. So under the hints, one of them is this ancestry member tree. Okay, I'm going to re review this tree. And when I do that, what I find is there is a tree that gives me some clues about this particular individual. And I find there's a spouse listed for Mary Alice Rowell being Charles Smith Wright. Again, that makes sense because this is the Wright family tree. So Charles Smith Wright here is this individual. I'm going to then, when I look at that, when I'm reviewing this tree, I see that Charles Smith Wright was born in Oswego County, New York. This is my first interesting connection. I have ancestors from Oswego County, New York. Now, does this mean I found the connection? Does this mean anything at all? Absolutely not. All it means is this is a potential source for me to pursue. So now I build Charles's family tree. I add his fathers, his grandparents, and uh, mothers, and so on and so forth, adding as much as I can until I get to a point where I have a tree and I've identified now a genealogical connection. Seth Johnson and Sarah Streeter, Streeter here are also individuals that are in my family tree. So now I have this genealogical connection. Have I proven anything? Absolutely not. I don't know if this is, explains our shared DNA, whether this person is actually in his tree or whether he's made a mistake. I don't know anything like that. What I do know is I have a clue. 
This is a clue that I did not have and could not essentially have until I built out this quick and dirty tree. Now I can pursue this, I can add documentation, and I can do the work to make sure that I'm not jumping to an incorrect conclusion. So again, we have not proven anything. We've merely generated a clue in this process. Another thing, important thing to recognize is that we've only built out about 50% of the lines in this tree. There's a, a whole other set of grandparents that we didn't even look at. And there's a chance that our relationship could actually be through those other two grandparents. So to avoid confirmation bias, we don't solely focus now on this Johnson Streeter connection. Instead, what we want to do is we want to build out the tree as much as possible to make sure that we've eliminated other possibilities. The more we want to use this as genealogical evidence in a conclusion, the more work we're going to have to do to make sure we're not engaging in some um, confirmation bias. So now that we have this, we build out the tree, we add the documentation, we make sure that what I have and what they have is actually genealogically correct. This will obviously take a lot longer than the quick and dirty tree, but that's fine. We are not blindly working in the dark here. Now we have a connection, we have a clue we can work and build on and from that information. An important thing to note is that this method is certainly not foolproof. There are a ton of reasons why you can build these quick and dirty trees and never find the genealogical connection. For example, uh, your connection may be in a part of your tree that has holes. It might be in a part of their tree that can't be built out easily in a quick and dirty method. It might be because their tree has a misattributed parentage event. Your tree might have a misattributed parentage event. Uh, the connection might be further back than you can build trees for these individuals. There are a ton of reasons why this might not work. So Rather than spending months and weeks and days trying to build a tree, I recommend you build this quick and dirty tree trying to find the connection. Now, if you don't find it, then you need to decide where the cost-benefit analysis is. Do you keep working or do you move on to a different tree? For me, that cost-benefit analysis always depends on how important the match is to me. If this is a very good, promising, close match, then I'm going to spend more time trying to find that connection. The more distant the match, the less time I'm going to spend and the more I'm going to work on these quick and dirty trees. So that's the matching tree method. That's how you build these quick and dirty trees. And this is a very brief introduction to try to find the genealogical connection. Rather than spinning your wheels for days and weeks trying to find a connection with a match, hopefully you can build these quick and dirty trees and start to get clues about how you might be connected. While we're here, I just wanted to give you a really brief introduction to DNA Central. DNA Central is a membership DNA education portal. So um, it's at dna-central.com. At this membership portal, there are uh, DNA courses, there's a bi-weekly newsletter, there's webinars, there's all sorts of resources if you want to learn more about DNA. And I have a, a, just a quick coupon code, q and if you use that code, you get $10 off a one-year membership, which is normally $99. So if you're interested in joining DNA Central, use that coupon code and become a member. So that's the matching tree method. This is one example of building a quick and dirty tree that can lead to identifying a potential genealogical conclusion. Keeping in mind, it is only hints. In this one example for um, here, I was able to build this tree and find this genealogical conclusion in less than an hour. So it can be done very, very quickly in many cases. In other cases, it can't. So it's, 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 a, it's a sort of a, a fishing expedition. But when it works, it can be very valuable and can give you some really valuable clues. Thank you for watching.